Mm -hmm. uh, so my question, uh, my question, my paper focuses on the relationship of poetic and religious discourse, more precisely on the question of the specificity of religious discourse. It is one of Ricoeur's guiding, guiding ideas that religious language is a variety of poetic discourse, but that on the other hand, it is a unique case, thanks to certain strategies of discourse like transgression, intensification, and extravagance. It is in this context that he draws upon Ian T. Ramsey's views of religious language as characterized by a structure of models and qualifiers. And so for this reason, my paper will consist of three parts. The first part, in the first part I will present Ian T. Ramsey's conception of religious language. This presentation will serve as a background to Ricoeur's view of religious language. The second part will be devoted to Ricoeur's view of religious language and especially the question of the specificity of religious language. And the third part, which is going to be short, uh, in this part I will want to say a few words about my own position, uh, uh, my own view of Ricoeur's position. So the first part, I, uh, I come to my first part, uh, which is dedicated to Ian T. Ramsey. I think I should say at least two words about Ian T. Ramsey. I'm not talking about Frank Paul Ramsey. Uh, I'm talking about Ian T. Ramsey, who was a philosopher of religion, uh, born in 1915, 15, two years after Ricoeur, died in 1972. Uh, uh, so he was younger than Ricoeur, he mm. has died long ago. Uh, he, he has been teaching philosophy of religion, um, of religious language, one could say, I think in Oxford. And in 1966, he became a bishop of Durham. Uh, so uh, he continued to, to give lectures, but... but uh, after 1966, uh, he was, uh, his, his time was mainly consumed by his work as a, as a bishop. I think, though I do not know it uh, really, that he must have met Paul Ricoeur in 1967 because uh, there is, uh, in, in the volume uh, containing the lectures of the Royal Institute of Philosophy of, the, of 1967, uh, under the heading Talk of God, there is uh, Ricoeur uh, uh, gave his uh, article, famous article, Guilt, Ethics and Religion, I think, and, and Ramsey uh, had a, 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 a paper, on, a presentation on, on the theme of hell uh, there. I suppose that they have met, but uh, in, in the biography of, of David Edwards, I didn't find anything about it. So, first part, Ramsey. In the early 50s of the last century, so we are in a far away past, in the early 50s of the last century, when Ramsey published his first articles, the star of logical positivism was already in full decline. Nevertheless, the debate in the philosophy of religion was still dominated by the dogmas of logical positivism, the main dogma being that there are only two types of meaningful statements, the tautological statements of logic and mathematics and statements about empirical facts. For the latter, the criterion of being empirically verifiable, respectively later on falsifiable, was considered decisive. All other statements, for instance of metaphysics, ethics or religion, were claimed to be just meaningless. As such, they couldn't be true or false. 
any discussion about the truth or falsity of a certain religious or theological assertion was thus ruled out right from the start. It was to this kind of challenge that Ramsey tried to respond. And I quote from an article in 1952, the challenge of contemporary philosophy to Christianity. Ramsey writes, the challenge of the, the falsification problem makes is to demand, on the one hand, that we establish some integral connection between theological words and the rest of language. And, on the other hand, that we give some account of the sort of fact to which theological words can appeal for their empirical relevance. We must discover the logical status of theological words, including, for instance, their relation to and difference from the words of a scientific assertion. And he goes on to face the challenge which contemporary philosophy makes on us. We must, A, justify a position for theological words on a language map, and B, in particular, elucidate their empirical relevance. So already in this early article, we find this program, and those of you who are familiar with Recur will realize that uh, these are quite different challenges to the ones Recur is reacting to. I jump immediately uh, to his major work, uh, published in 1957, and the, the title is uh, Religious language, an empirical placing of theological phrases. So it's programmatic. Uh, um, Ramsey doesn't start, so the theme is religious language, but Ramsey doesn't start with an analysis of the linguistic properties of religious language. In other words, he does not start with the question, what kind of language is religious language? But he starts with the question, to what situation does religion appeal? Or, as he also puts it, what kind of empirical anchorage have theological words? That's his question at the beginning. His answer, the empirical anchorage of religious language consists in, quote, characteristically religious situations, or as he also puts it, disclosure situations. This is the empirical anchorage of, uh, of theological words. A disclosure, disclosure situation, whether religious or not, is a situation where the light dawns, the ice breaks, the penny drops, where a situation becomes alive. Two moments are constitutive for such a disclosure situation. It combines an odd discernment with a total commitment. Ramsey illustrates the first point uh, with many, uh, or both points with many examples, one of them being a somewhat melodramatic story about a judge who, in the middle of his investigations, suddenly discovers that the accused person in the Kiss case is his long-lost wife. I meets I, nicknames are exchanged, the court is electrified, and his third impersonal situation becomes alive, comments Ramsey. The situation has taken on depth. This is a quote. It has become, in a certain way, partly elusive. It is spatial, temporal, and more. Such a characteristically personal situation, as Ramsey calls it, 
calls for a spe special kind of language. It cannot be expressed in legal language or in any kind of impersonal object language. Ramsey finds th in this situation a discernment akin to religious inside discernment vision. So he, he, he seeks parallels for religious insight in normal life. My favorite is what comes now. Other parallels from ordinary life for him, from other parallels from ordinary life for situations which exhibit such a, such a special discernment might be found in, quote, all those situations existentialists become excited about when they stress the significance of authentic existence in contrast to merely existing. So these are parallels from ordinary life uh, to, to these uh, specific religious disclosure situations. He does not equate them, but he says this is a parallel which is a, gives us a clue to that. So far, so much about the discernment character. Ramsey illustrates the commitment character of a disclosure uh, by telling a story of a man who risks his own life in order to save the life of, of a child who is in danger to drown, or other parallels from ordinary experience to the total commitment character of a religious disclosure can be found in action from a sense of duty or in the loyalty giving, given to a po person, an institution, or a nation. And, and he, he also uh, uh, mentions pastimes, uh, where, like uh, fishing, for instance. For some people, uh, everything is uh, you know, the whole total loyalty goes to fishing, which leads to uh, what he calls significant tautologies, like fishing is fishing. It reminds me of the, of, of the of, 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 of the paper of, of Monique uh, Contos Berber, which was talking about this. Uh, when you ask why did you do this, you finally end up with I am I. And, and uh, so, so if someone asks why did you go fishing, fishing is fishing, and why do you like fishing, I am I. This, this is for him a clue, one of the clues for religious language, but uh, the main thing and uh, the, the main point of connection with the view of Ricoeur is his uh, model and qualifier um, uh, vocabulary. It is only in step two of his argument uh, that Ramsey turns to, to the linguistic properties specific for a religious language. If this discernment commitment, this is a quote, if this discernment commitment is the kind of situation characteristic of religion, we must expect religious language to be appropriately odd and to have a distinctive logical behavior. Otherwise, it would not be currency for the strange kind of situation about which it claims to speak. So the, the argument goes, these are the situations or this term and total commitment, and therefore the, the, the language has to be odd to this odd discernment character. Um, but uh, this argument takes, uh, for me, a surprising turn because the, the argument goes not, not like this, First, there is this odd discernment, and second, to articulate, uh, we need an odd language, but uh, Ramsey does not want so much want to say religious language articulates or expresses uh, such situations, but that religious language evokes such, such situations. Uh, well, uh, I'll jump over some of, uh, immediately to the model and qualifier um, uh, vocabulary, where, uh, and uh, I think it will become more clear. According to Ramsey, theological attributes of God, we are not speaking of the language of the Bible, but we are talking about theological attributes of God like first cause or infinitely wise, may be regarded as qualified models. 
And a model is, quote, a situation, a situation with which we are all familiar and which can be used for reaching another situation with which we are not familiar. That's the model, a situation with which we are familiar. The qualifier is a, quote, is a directive which prescribes in a special way of developing those model situations. In the case of the expression first cause, the word cause serves as the model, while the word first serves as the qualifier. The word cause refers us to situations with which we are familiar, while the word first, quote, presses us to move backward and still forward. And because the causal story is such as can keep us going as long as anyone wishes, the directive backward and, and still backward is always to be able to be obeyed. End of the quote. If we follow the direction which is prescribed by the qualifier first, we build up a pattern of terms and relations until finally a characteristically different situation is evoked. That's his claim. When the light dawns, the planet drops, etc., the ice breaks. At that point, there is a sense of the unseen, the sense of something mysterious which eludes the grasp of causal language. The causal language game is played until, at some point, point or other, the disclosure situation is evoked. And, quote, when that happens, it is in relation to such a situation that the word God is posited. I go over to Ricoeur. What are the connections and what are the differences? I think the differences are quite, without uh, talking much about it, uh, one can feel the difference uh, of, of this kind of discourse on religious language and that of Ricoeur. Two limitations, I will limit myself to articles um, published between 1970 and 1980. That's the one limitation. The other limitation is the thematic limitation. I will not try to give a full account of the theory of, of religious language, but uh, will concentrate on the question of the specificity, specificity of, of religious discourse or language. Um, my friend, I want to jump over some points, like the one point is, is religious language or religious discourse, it's, to, if one wants to speak exactly, it's discourse we are talking about, acts of discourse and not language as a system of, of, of science. Uh, I jump also across the next point, religious discourse is, he uh, presupposes this, or he makes it explicit that he presupposes this, is when it's meaningful discourse. It is meaningful at least for the members of the community of faith who use it. I will dwell on two points. The one I've called originary expressions of faith on the one hand, and second order discourse of theology on the other hand. For Ricoeur, the basic type of religious language, or more exactly discourse, are not theological statements. So he is not interested in first cause or something like that. Uh, are not theological statements in the sense of metaphysical speculative theology, but, quote, expressions embedded in such modes of discourse as narratives, prophecies, legislative texts, proverbs and wisdom sayings, hymns, prayers and liturg liturgical formulas. This non-conceptual, symbolic, in a certain sense, poetic language constitutes the originary expressions of faith, the first order discourse of religious belief, while the conceptual language of theology has the status of a second order discourse, which presupposes the primary expressions. Because main interest is directed to the first order discourse of religious language, not to the conceptual language of theology. A hermeneutic, hermeneutical philosophy will try to get as close as possible to the most originary expressions of a community of faith, to those expressions through which the members of this community have interpreted their experience for the sake of themselves or for others' sake. 
I will jump over the next very important point, the polyphonic language of the Bible. He says, uh, in short, for recur, turning to the originary expressions of faith means turning to the Bible, but far from being a homogeneous corpus, the Bible presents itself as a very complex textual entity. The original expressions of faith in the Bible Bible are not of one kind, not at all, and we find their narrative, prophetic discourse, prescriptive discourse, wisdom literature, apocalyptic discourse, and so on. So on. And uh, this is very important because the content cannot be seen as uh, separated from the form in which it is formulated. And so uh, <laughs> I just give one quote, perhaps an exhaustive inquiry, if one were possible, would disclose that all these forms of discourse together constitute a circular system and that the theological content of each one of, the, of them receives its signification from the total constellation of the forms of discourse. Religious language would then appear as a polyphonic language sustained by the circularity of forms. The, uh, the parables of Jesus are for recur a paradigmatic case. And now I come close to the point I want to make about the specific specificity of religious language. Uh, why are they uh, paradigmatic? Be because they combine a narrative form and a metaphorical process and are thus an outstanding example of poetic discourse. Narrative plus metaphor uh, that, uh, that puts it in the field of poetic discourse. But uh, there's also a third trait, uh, um, and, which is, and this one is important with regard to the relationship of poetic and religious discourse. According to Ricoeur, the parables of Jesus are characterized by a logic of extravagance. They contain scandalous, extraordinary traits which make, a, make of the seemingly normal story an odd story. By these improbable, irritating elements, the, parable transgress, the parables transgress the form of a normal story. Ricoeur sees the same logic at work in the proverbial sayings of Jesus and in the eschatological proclamations of Jesus. Uh, yeah, I quote, if the case of the parable is exemplary, it is because it combines a narrative structure, a metaphorical process, and a limit expression. This is this third trait of extravagance, of, uh, of transgression, and so on. In this way, it constitutes a short summary of the naming of God. Uh, okay, I, I go on. So what is the specificity, specificity of religious discourse? Ricoeur holds that religious texts are poetic texts. This is the basic assertion about the relationship of the two forms of extended discourse, as you, as you heard of David Pellauer. But Ricoeur doesn't leave this basic statement without qualification. Religious discourse is a variety of poetic discourse only up to a certain point. Uh, uh, religious texts are poetic texts, quote, in such a way that they are differentiated from other forms of poetic discourse and so on. Religious discourse is a unique and eccentric case of poetic discourse. But what makes of it this unique kind of poetic discourse? It is here that he draws upon Ramsey's vocabulary of models and qualifiers to make his point. According to Ricoeur, re religious language modifies poetic language using strategies like intensification or transgression or as Ricoeur also puts it, by going to the limit. The poetic language is the model, the intensification is the qualifier, and we end up with the qualified model, religious language as odd language. 
so uh, e, uh, one could one could um, look at how uses Ramsey modeling qualifier and how it, uh, how does recur, but I want, just want to get to my point. If I interpret recurs position correctly, he seems to opt for the view that religious discourse can be identified on purely linguistic grounds, on, on purely semantic grounds. There are certain identifiable linguistic features which make, make the religious discourse a religious discourse, which produce the specificity of religious discourse. Or, in, um, to put it in a negative way, which prevent that religious discourse is just seen as one kind of poetic discourse, among others. I come to my point. Uh, uh, what do I think of this? Um, I think I do not find it convincing what Ricoeur says, namely, quote, that it is not so much the metaphorical function as such which constitutes religious language as it is a certain intensification of the metaphorical function. Why do I not find this convincing? I think this, the strategies of intensification, of transgression, belong to the, I put it this way, the craftsmanship of a poet. And, and, and there is no way to, of saying, uh, 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 this is no criterion. If, if you take let's, parables of Kafka, for instance, and parables of Jesus, I don't think you can differentiate between, between them by saying the parables of Jesus have this kind of transgression, while the parables of Kafka's, Kafka do not. Uh, so what would be my solution? <laughs> Uh, and I'm very hesitant about this, but I, I say it. As, uh, li to, according to my mind, religious texts are religious as far as and as long as they are considered to be religious texts by the members of a certain contingent historical community of faith. Or to be more precise, as far as and as long as they are used by members of a certain community of faith in a way they consider to be religious. There are no, according to my mind, different to recur, there are no linguistic features immanent to a text which allow to identify unambiguously a certain text as a religious text. The specificity of a of religious discourse does not reside inside the text. It depends on the outside of the text, on the ling non-linguistic context. And with this assertion, which is more of a question than an affirmation, I close. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I, I, I appreciate a lot the, the way you discuss the, the solution of Ricoeur, but uh, we have a lot of questions, but uh, I open to the assistants. The questions. Uh... Yeah. I, 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 I thank you very much. I very much appreciate it also, uh, especially the, the idea of fluidity in the in the expression of Picard and in the way in the multiple ways he he talks about things leading to to his to his to his confidence, to his belief. But when we speak of poetry in each year, we can speak of music. And so it, it brings up to mind uh, something which can be uh, seen as something musical and, and poetic in, in the global sense. I don't know if you, uh, if you see that, or if we can see I'm, 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 I'm. I'm not sure about your question or your comment. Well, uh, uh, would you, would you uh, see polyphony in music with somebody who composed a piece of music uh, in a polyphonic style to be able to, to, uh, to uh, present an idea 
of his way of, of looking at uh, his belief in terms of I, I think that's a, a good point I, I, of which I, I, I agree with, uh, that he says that the Bible does not speak with one voice, just one voice, but w with many voices. Uh, and it, it is very important uh, to see this, this polyphonic character. And, and it, it's, it's the whole picture that counts, and not, not, not one, one single voice. I, I think this is very fruitful and, and and uh, I like this thought very much. Uh, the, I have uh, uh, that it would be part of of, of a critical appraisal, like I promised, it, uh, to 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 make this point strong. To, 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 because I, he, he does not only say it as an idea, but he. He, he works it out. He, he says, for instance, we have narrative and we have prophecy. And we do not only have narrative and prophecy, but we have the tension between narrative and prophecy. And we do not only have the tension between this, but between wisdom literature and eschatological literature. And we have the tension and so on. So, so it, makes, it, it, it makes clear how, how complex of, of a complex form of discourse we have here. Uh, because we, like Ramsey, when Ramsey devotes 60 pages to, to the Bible, the, the greatest part in, in religious language uh, is, is devoted to, to the Bible, but uh, in a way it all ends up, up all, not all, but most of it, model qualifier. Yeah? Uh, and maybe significant tautology, like I, am I uh, and maybe some other typographical devices, but, but his main model is is a model qualifier, and with this he tries to, to catch uh, uh, the whole of it, and I think, no, 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 it's, it's, it's incredibly, it's incredibly, it's really a great code uh, we have here uh, to use uh, the, the, the word of Northrop Fry, no, the title, the book title. Okay. Other questions? Okay. Well, um I think uh, I have more a um, um, suggestion or a remark than a question. But I was thinking about uh, um, if we um, look at um, what the recurs, um, concept of metaphor uh, is, then it is um, implied that he doesn't uh, make much difference uh, between uh, general uh, poetics or uh, religious poetics. Um, there are um, believers or theologians who say about um, a metaphor of God that there is a comparison um, between um, God in a fixed ID and uh, a rather fixed ID and, and something other. But uh, when Ricoeur speaks about parallel, Parabels, yes. Then he um, uh, stresses that um, what is said, of what is compared, is um, uh, not a fixed idea of God. He compares uh, the what is the word, the, uh, the seed and the the, the kingdom <coughs> and uh, the kingdom of God and there are several kinds of seed. But there is no fixed uh, ID. And, um, um, well, you can, um, you can um, compare a lot of uh, things, but it's not a special uh, religious. Okay? So uh, that is what he, he uh, uh, that, that, that's what he says in, a, in, in, a, um, in his theory about metaphor, yes, and what is poetic work. So, your contribution reminds me of, uh, I should note that Ricoeur also has another kind of, 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 of making a plea for the specificity of, of religious discourse and uh, by pointing to the role the word God is playing in, in the biblical discourse. It is sort of some kind of unifying uh, all the different texts uh, uh, I, I was reminded of, of the idea of Ramsey, of a total language map, which of a language which is hierarchical, hierarchically structured, 
and you need uh, to, for the language, the total language to be finite, you need the word God. This is some kind of, I don't know, uh, linguistic proof of, of the necessity, not of God, but of the word God. Uh, I think I would not press this because I don't think that this, there's a way to, to revive this. I, I don't think it did work at that time. But what it points to is, is the, the um, I have to admit, the word God plays a unique role in, the, in biblical discourse. Yeah. Uh, but still, I would stick to my thesis. It's not on the ground on, of, 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 of inner features of the text that, that, uh, that the text is religious. You cannot, uh, for instance, Greek tragedy. Uh, is, is a Greek tragedy a religious text? Uh, my answer would be, it used to be when it was part uh, uh, of, of a religious ceremony, like it used to be in, in Athens. Uh, it, it isn't anymore. We go to the theater and consume it as some kind of poetic text. It, uh, and I think the same is uh, Bertolt Brecht, for instance, uh, when I asked what, what, what was the book he loved most, he answered, you will love the Bible. Yeah? Uh, so, but uh, I suppose he, for him it, the Bible was a great book of poetry, uh, and, and it was not the dimension of transcendence or the naming of God uh, what, what made this his, his favorite book. Uh, so you can look at the Bible uh, as, as uh, a strictly uh, um, a great book of a great collection of poetry. That, that's that's what I uh, what I think. Uh, what I also think is that a religious believer or the most members of a religious community of communities of, of faith would would say it is a great it is great poetry like a muslim would say that the greatest poetry is the quran yeah? but it's it's more than that and it's not primarily primarily a poetic discourse while recur makes the point it's that one should understand uh, the concept of revelation the bible as a revealed word of god in the way that is it, it is revealing, with regard to our existence, like every poetic discord is revealing. Revealed because it is revealing. Uh, uh, so uh, I think this, uh, this would not be, uh, uh, many believers would not be happy with, they would say that this is part of the story, but not the whole.